Leonardo da Vinci, April 15, 1452 to May 2, 1519, was an Italian polymath of the High Renaissance who worked as a painter, draftsman, engineer, scientist, thinker, sculptor, and architect. While his popularity was primarily built on his achievements as a painter, he is also recognized for his notebooks, in which he drew and took notes on a wide range of disciplines, including anatomy, astronomy, botany, cartography, painting, and paleontology. Leonardo is widely considered as a genius who embodied the Renaissance humanist ideal, and his combined works make a contribution to future generations of artists equal only to that of his younger contemporary Michelangelo. Andrea del Verrocchio, an Italian painter and sculptor, educated him in Florence after he was born out of wedlock to a prosperous notary and a lower-class woman near Vinci. He began his career in the city, but later worked with Ludovico Sforza in Milan for a significant period of time. Later, he worked in Florence and Milan again, as well as temporarily in Rome, attracting a sizable following of imitators and students. On Francis I's invitation, he spent his final three years in France, where he died in 1519. Since his death, his achievements, diversified interests, personal life, and empirical thinking have never failed to arouse attention and admiration, making him a frequent namesake. Culture is also a subject. Leonardo is regarded as one of the finest painters in art history, and he is frequently credited with founding the High Renaissance movement. Despite having many lost works and fewer than 25 acknowledged major works, including numerous incomplete works, he produced some of Western art's most influential paintings. His masterpiece, The Mona Lisa, is often regarded as the world's most renowned painting. The Last Supper is the most widely reproduced religious picture of all time, and his Vitruvian Man drawing is also considered a cultural symbol. Salvatore Mundi, credited in whole or in part to Leonardo, was sold at auction in 2017 for 450.3 million US dollars, setting a new record for the most expensive painting ever sold at public auction. He was revered for his technological genius, having invented flying machines, an armored war vehicle, concentrated solar power, a ratio machine that could be employed in an adding machine, and the double hull. Few of his concepts were built or even viable during his lifetime, as contemporary scientific techniques to metallurgy and engineering were still in their early stages during the Renaissance. Some of his lesser-known inventions, such as an automated bobbin winder and a system for evaluating wire tensile strength, made their way into the world of manufacturing. He produced significant discoveries in anatomy, civil engineering, hydrodynamics, geology, optics, and tribology, but he never published his results, which had little to no direct impact on subsequent science. Biography Early Life, 1452-1472 Birth and Background Leonardo da Vinci, technically called Leonardo di Ser Piero da Vinci, Leonardo, son of Ser Piero from Vinci, was born on April 15, 1452, in or around the Tuscan hill town of Vinci, about 20 miles from Florence. He was born out of wedlock to Piero da Vinci, Ser Piero da Vinci d'Antonio di Ser Piero di Ser Guido, 1426-1504, a Florentine legal notary, and Caterina di Mio Lippi, circa 1434 to 1494, from a lesser class. It is unknown where Leonardo was born, the traditional account, based on a local oral tradition recorded by historian Emanuele Rapetti, is that he was born in Anchiano, a country hamlet that would have provided adequate privacy for the illegitimate birth, though it is still possible that he was born in a house in Florence that Ser Piero almost certainly owned. Leonardo's parents married separately a year after his birth. Caterina, who later appears in Leonardo's writings as only Caterina or Caitlina, is most commonly identified as Caterina Budi del Vaca, who married the local artisan Antonio di Piero Budi del Vaca, also known as La Catabriga, the quarrelsome one. Ser Piero married Albiera Amadori after being engaged to her the year before, and after her death in 1464, he married three more times. Leonardo eventually had 16 half siblings. 11 of whom survived infancy, from his several marriages, all of whom were much younger than him, the last was born when Leonardo was 46 years old, and with whom he had minimal interaction. 
Little is known about Leonardo's infancy, and much is veiled in myth, thanks in part to his biography in Giorgio Vasari's largely apocryphal lives of the most excellent painters, sculptors, and architects, 1550, written in the 16th century. Tax records show that by at least 1457, he was living in the household of his paternal grandpa, Antonio da Vinci. However, it is conceivable that he spent the years preceding this in the care of his mother in Vinci, possibly Anciano or Campo Zeppi in the parish of San Pantaleone. He is supposed to have been close to his uncle, Francesco da Vinci, but his father was presumably in Florence the majority of the time. Ser Piero, a descendant of a long line of notaries, maintained an official house in Florence by at least 1469 and enjoyed a prosperous career. Despite his family heritage, Leonardo only had a minimal and informal education in vernacular, writing, reading, and arithmetic. Maybe because his artistic abilities were recognized early on, his family chose to concentrate their efforts there. Later in life, Leonardo documented his earliest memory, which is now preserved in the Codex Atlanticus. While riding on bird flight, he recalled as a child how a kite came to his crib and opened his lips with its tail. Observers continue to discuss whether the incident was true or a fantasy. Veracchio's Workshop Leonardo's family relocated to Florence in the mid-1460s, when the city was the epicenter of Christian humanist philosophy and culture. Around the age of 14, he worked as a garzon, studio kid, in the workshop of Andrea del Veracchio, the most prominent Florentine painter and sculptor of his time. Around this time, Veracchio's master, the famous sculptor Donatello, passed away. Leonardo became an apprentice at the age of 17 and stayed in training for seven years. Other well-known painters who apprenticed or were linked with the school include Ghirlandaio, Perugino, Botticelli, and Lorenzo di Credi. Leonardo had both theoretical and practical training in drafting, chemistry, metallurgy, metalworking, plaster casting, leather working, mechanics, and woodworking, as well as artistic abilities such as sketching, painting, sculpting, and modeling. Leonardo was a contemporary of Botticelli, Ghirlandaio, and Perugino, all of whom were slightly older than him. He would have met them in Veracchio's workshop or the Medici Platonic Academy. Florence was adorned with the works of artists such as Donatello's contemporaries Masaccio, whose figurative frescoes were imbued with realism and emotion, and Ghiberti, whose gates of paradise, gleaming with gold leaf, demonstrated the art of combining complex figure compositions with detailed architectural backgrounds. Piero della Francesca conducted a thorough study of perspective and was the first painter to do a scientific study of light. These investigations, together with Leon Battista Alberti's treatise De Pictura, had a significant impact on younger artists, particularly Leonardo's own views and artworks. Many of the paintings at Veracchio's workshop were completed by his assistants. According to Vasari, Leonardo collaborated with Veracchio on his The Baptism of Christ, c. 1472-1475, painting the young angel holding Jesus's robe with skills so far superior to his masters that Veracchio purportedly put down his brush and never painted again, the latter claim probably apocryphal. The new oil paint method was used on portions of the predominantly tempera painting, such as the scenery, the rocks visible through the brown mountain stream, and much of Jesus' figure, suggesting Leonardo's hand. Furthermore, Leonardo may have served as a model for two of Veracchio's works, the bronze figure of David in the Bargello and the archangel Raphael in Tobias and Angel. Vasari narrates the incident of Leonardo as a young man, a local farmer created a round buckler shield and asked Ser Piero to paint it for him. Leonardo, inspired by the story of Medusa, reacted with a horrific painting of a monster spitting fire, so his father purchased a different shield for the peasant and sold Leonardo's to a Florentine art dealer for 100 ducats, who then sold it to the Duke of Milan. First Florentine Period, 1472, c.1482 Leonardo became a master in the Guild of St. Luke, the Guild of Painters and Doctors of Medicine, in 1472, at the age of 20, but even after his father established his own workshop, his loyalty to Veracchio was such that he remained to collaborate and live with him. Leonardo's first known dated work is a 1473 pen and ink drawing of the Arno Valley, see below. 
According to Vasari, the youthful Leonardo was the first to propose making the Arno River a navigable route connecting Florence and Pisa. In January 1478, Leonardo got an independent contract to paint an altarpiece for the chapel of St. Bernard in the Palazzo Vecchio, demonstrating his independence from Veracchio's studio. Anonimo Gadiano, an unnamed early biographer, reports that in 1480 Leonardo lived with the Medici and frequently worked in the garden of the Piazza San Marco in Florence, where the Medici built a Neoplatonic college of artists, poets, and philosophers. In March 1481, the monks of San Donato in Scopito sent him a commission for the adoration of the Magi. Both of these original assignments were abandoned when Leonardo proceeded to offer his skills to the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza. Leonardo wrote a letter to Sforza in which he recounted his various accomplishments in engineering and weapon creation, as well as his painting abilities. He brought a silver string instrument shaped like a horse's head, possibly a lute or lyre. Leonardo visited the Medici's home with Alberti and met the older humanist philosophers, the most notable of whom were Marsilio Ficino, a Neoplatonist, Cristoforo Landino, a writer of commentaries on classical writings, and John Argyripolis, a Greek teacher and Aristotelian translator. Leonardo's contemporary, the bright young poet and philosopher Pico della Mirandola, was also a member of the Medici Platonic Academy. Lorenzo de Medici dispatched Leonardo as an ambassador in 1482 to Ludovico I. L. Moro, who ruled Milan from 1479 until 1499. First Milanese period, circa 1482 to 1499. Leonardo worked in Milan from 1482 to 1499. He was commissioned to paint the Virgin of the Rocks for the Immaculate Conception Confraternity and the Last Supper for the Santa Maria del Grazie Monastery. In the spring of 1485, Leonardo traveled to Hungary, on behalf of Sforza, to visit King Matthias Corvinus, who commissioned him to paint a Madonna. In 1490, he was hired as a consultant for the construction of Pavia's Cathedral, with Francesco di Giorgio Martini, and was struck by Regisol's horse figure, which he sketched. Leonardo worked on numerous additional projects for Sforza, such as the preparation of floats and pageants for major events. A drawing of a wooden model was created for a competition to design the cupola for Milan Cathedral, as well as a model for a massive equestrian monument honoring Ludovico's predecessor, Francesco Sforza. This would have eclipsed the size of the only two major equestrian statues of the Renaissance, Donatello's Gattamelida in Padua and Veracchio's Bartolomeo Caglioni in Venice, earning it the nickname Gran Cavallo. Leonardo finished a model for the horse and detailed plans for its casting, but in November 1494, Ludovico handed the medal to his brother-in-law to be used as a cannon to defend the city from Charles VIII of France. According to contemporary letters, the Duke of Milan commissioned Leonardo and his helpers to paint the Sala del Assi in Sforza Castle in 1498. The proposal evolved into a trompe-l'oeil décor in which the Great Hall appeared to be a pergola made up of the interlaced branches of sixteen mulberry trees, with an elaborate labyrinth of leaves and knots hanging from the ceiling. Second Florentine period, 1500-1508 When France overthrew Ludovico Sforza in 1500, Leonardo left Milan for Venice with his assistant Salai and friend, mathematician Luca Pasilai. Leonardo worked in Venice as a military architect and engineer, inventing strategies to defend the city from naval attack. On his return to Florence in 1500, he and his household were guests of the Servite monks at the monastery of Santissima Annunziata. They were furnished with a workshop where, according to Vasari, Leonardo created the cartoon of the Virgin. And child with Saint Anne and Saint John the Baptist, a painting so popular that men and women, young and old, rushed to view it as if they were going to a solemn festival. In 1502, Leonardo joined the service of Cesare Borgia, Pope Alexander V.I.'s son, working as a military architect and engineer while traveling throughout Italy with his patron. To gain Cesare Borgia's favor, Leonardo prepared a map of his fortress, as well as a town design for Imola. After seeing it, Cesare engaged Leonardo as his primary military engineer and architect. Later in the year, Leonardo made another map for his client, one of Chiana Valley, Tuscany, so that his patron could have a better overlay of land a stronger strategic position. 
He developed this chart in conjunction with his other idea, which was to build a dam from the sea to Florence to provide a steady flow of water to the canal throughout the year. Leonardo had left Borgia's service and returned to Florence in early 1503, rejoining the Guild of St. Luke on October 18th, that year. By this month, Leonardo had began work on a portrait of Lisa del Giocondo, the model for the Mona Lisa, which he would continue until his death. In January 1504, he served on a committee tasked with recommending a location for Michelangelo's David Monument. He then spent two years in Florence planning and painting a mural for the Signoria depicting the Battle of Anghiari, which Michelangelo designed with the Battle of Cassina. In 1506, Leonardo was summoned to Milan by the city's acting French governor, Charles II d'Amboise. There, Leonardo took on another student, Count Francesco Melzi, the son of a Lombard aristocrat and often regarded as his favorite. The Council of Florence wanted Leonardo to return quickly to finish the Battle of Anghiari, but he was granted leave at the request of Louis XII, who was considering paying the artist to create several portraits. Leonardo may have begun a project for an equestrian figure of D'Amboise, a wax model exists and, if authentic, it is the only remaining specimen of Leonardo's sculpture. Other than that, Leonardo was free to follow his scientific interests. Many of Leonardo's most well-known students, including Bernardino Luini, Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio, and Marco Diagiono, knew or worked with him in Milan. In 1507, Leonardo was in Florence resolving a disagreement with his brothers over their father's fortune, who had died in 1504. Second Milanese period, 1508-1513 by 1508, Leonardo was back in Milan, residing in his own house at Porto Oriental in the parish of Santa Biabola. In 1512, Leonardo was working on ideas for an equestrian monument for John Giacomo Trivulzio, when an invasion by a coalition of Swiss, Spanish, and Venetian forces drove the French out of Milan. Leonardo remained in the city, spending several months in 1513 at the Medici's Vaprio Dieta House. Rome and France 1513-1519. Lorenzo de Medici's son Giovanni assumed the papacy, as Leo X, in March 1513, and Leonardo traveled to Rome in September, when he was greeted by the Pope's brother Giuliano. From September 1513 to 1516, Leonardo lived in the Apostolic Palace's Belvedere Courtyard, where Michelangelo and Raphael were also active. Leonardo received a monthly allowance of 33 ducats and, according to Vasari, dressed a lizard with quicksilver scales. The Pope awarded him a painting commission with an unknown subject matter, but cancelled it when the artist began developing a new type of varnish. Leonardo grew unwell, possibly as a result of a series of strokes that eventually killed him. He practiced botany at Vatican City's gardens and was tasked with developing designs for the Pope's projected Pontine Marsh draining project. He also dissected cadavers, taking notes for a book on vocal cords, which he gave to an official in the hopes of recovering the Pope's favor, but was unsuccessful. In October 1515, King Francis I of France retook Milan. Leonardo attended Francis I and Leo X's meeting at Bologna on December 19. Leonardo joined France's service in 1516, and was allowed access to the manor house Clos Luce, located near the king's residence at the royal chateau d'Amboise. Being frequently visited by Francis, he created plans for an enormous castle town the king intended to build at Romorantin, as well as a mechanical lion that went toward the monarch during a pageant and, when struck by a wand, opened its chest to show a bouquet of lilies. Leonardo was joined by his friend and apprentice, Francesco Melzi, and was supported by a pension of 10,000 scudi. Melzi's picture of Leonardo is the only one known from his lifetime, along with a sketch by an anonymous assistant on the back of one of his studies, circa 1517, and a drawing by Giovanni Ambrogio Figino of an elderly Leonardo with his right arm wrapped in garments. The latter, along with the record of Louis d'Aragon's visit in October 1517, corroborate a tale of Leonardo's right hand being paralyzed when he was 65, which may explain why he left masterpieces like the Mona Lisa incomplete. He continued to work in some capacity until he became ill and spent several months bedridden. Death
Leonardo died in Clos Luce on May 2, 1519, at the age of 67, presumably from a stroke. Francis and I had become great friends. Vasari recalls Leonardo as lamenting on his deathbed, full of regret, that he had offended against God and men by failing to practice his art as he should have done. Vasari claims that in his latter days, Leonardo summoned a priest to make his confession and receive the Holy Sacrament. Vasari also claims that the monarch held Leonardo's head in his arms as he died, though this could be a tale rather than truth. In accordance with his wishes, sixty beggars bearing tapers accompanied Leonardo's casket. Melzi was Leonardo's primary heir and executor, inheriting not only money but also his paintings, tools, library, and personal possessions. Salai, Leonardo's longtime student and companion, and his servant Baptista de Villanis both received half of Leonardo's vineyards. His brothers received land, and his servant received a fur-lined cloak. Leonardo's remains were interred on August 12, 1519, in the Collegiate Church of St. Florentine at the Chateau d'Amboise. Some twenty years after Leonardo's death, the jeweler and artist Benvenuto Cellini recorded Francis saying, there had never been another man born in the world who knew as much as Leonardo, not so much about painting, sculpture, and architecture, but that he was a very great philosopher. In 1490, Salai, sometimes known as Il Saleno, the little unclean one, or the devil, joined Leonardo's home as an attendant. After only a year, Leonardo prepared a list of his misdeeds, calling him a thief, a liar, stubborn, and a glutton, after stealing money and valuables at least five times and spending a fortune on clothes. Nonetheless, Leonardo indulged him and kept him in his family for the following thirty years. Although Vasari reports that Leonardo taught him many things about painting, Salaya's work is generally considered to be of lower artistic worth than others among Leonardo's pupils, such as Marco Diagiono and Boltrafio. In a posthumous inventory of his property, Salai held a picture referred to as Jaconda, which was estimated at 505 lire, an extraordinarily high valuation for a small panel portrait. He died in 1524. Personal Life Despite the thousands of pages Leonardo left in notebooks and manuscripts, he made little references to his personal life. During Leonardo's lifetime, his amazing abilities of invention, great physical beauty, and infinite grace, as described by Vasari, as well as all other facets of his existence, piqued the interest of others. One such characteristic was his love of animals, which likely included vegetarianism and, according to Vasari, the practice of acquiring caged birds and releasing them. Leonardo had several acquaintances who are today well known in their areas or for their historical significance, notably mathematician Luca Pasilai, with whom he worked on the book Divina a Proportion in the 1490s, backslash. Leonardo does not appear to have had any close relationships with women, with the exception of Cecilia Gallerani and the Este sisters, Beatrice and Isabella. While traveling through Mantua, he drew a portrait of Isabella that appears to have been used to construct a painted portrait, which is now lost. Beyond friendship, Leonardo kept his personal life a mystery. His sexuality has been the focus of ridicule, investigation, and speculation. This practice originated in the mid-16th century and was revived in the 19th and 20th centuries, most famously by Sigmund Freud in Leonardo da Vinci, a memory of his childhood. Leonardo's most close relationships were likely with his students Salai and Melzi. Melzi, writing to tell Leonardo's brothers of his death, described Leonardo's affection for his students as both caring and intense. It has been asserted since the 16th century that these connections were sexual or erotic in character. In his biography of Leonardo, Walter Isaacson explicitly states that the relationship with Salai was close and homosexual. Court documents from 1476, when Leonardo was 24 years old, three additional young guys were charged with sodomy following an event involving a known male prostitute. The charges were dismissed due to a lack of evidence, and it is speculated that because one of the accused, Leonardo de Tornabuni, was related to Lorenzo de Medici, the family used their influence to ensure the dismissal. Since then, much has been written about his suspected homosexuality and its role in his art, particularly the androgyny and sensuality seen in St. John the Baptist and Bacchus, 
as well as a number of graphic erotic drawings. Paintings Despite modern recognition and love for Leonardo as a scientist and inventor, for the better part of four centuries, his fame was based on his achievements as a painter. A few works that have been confirmed or attributed to him are considered outstanding masterpieces. These paintings are well known for a number of characteristics that have been widely imitated by students and extensively analyzed by connoisseurs and critics. By the 1490s, Leonardo had already been dubbed a divine painter. Among the qualities that make Leonardo's art unique are his new techniques for laying on the paint, his deep knowledge of anatomy, light, flora, and geology, and his interest in physiognomy and how humans register emotion in expression. And gesture, his creative use of the human figure in figurative composition, and his exquisite tone gradation. All of these attributes are reflected in his most famous paintings, The Mona Lisa, The Last Supper, and The Virgin of the Rocks. Early Works Leonardo originally became well known for his work on the Baptism of Christ, which he painted alongside Verrocchio. Two further enunciations appear to have been painted during his time at Verrocchio's workshop. One is small, measuring 59 centimeters, 23 inches, long and 14 centimeters, 5.5 inches, tall. It is a predella that sits at the foot of a bigger composition, a painting by Lorenzo di Credi from which it has been removed. The other is a significantly larger work, measuring 217 centimeters, 85 in long. Leonardo used a formal arrangement in both enunciations, similar to two well-known Fra Angelico paintings of the same subject, with the Virgin Mary sitting or kneeling to the right of the picture, approached from the left by an angel in profile wearing a rich flowing garment, raised wings, and holding a lily. Although once assigned to Ghirlandaio, the larger painting is now more commonly attributed to Leonardo. In the smaller artwork, Mary averts her gaze and folds her hands in a sign of submission to God's plan. Mary is not subservient in the broader piece. The girl, interrupted in her reading by this unexpected messenger, places a finger in her Bible to mark the spot and lifts her hand in a polite greeting or astonishment. This peaceful young woman appears to accept her job as God's mother with confidence, rather than resignation. In this painting, the young Leonardo portrays the Virgin Mary in a humanist light, acknowledging humanity's part in God's incarnation. Paintings from the 1480s In the 1480s, Leonardo obtained two significant commissions and began another piece of revolutionary compositional significance. Two of the three were never completed, while the third took so long that it required extensive talks over completion and payment. One of these works was Saint Jerome in the Wilderness, which Bordelon relates with a trying era in Leonardo's life, as demonstrated by his diary entry. I thought I was learning to live, I was only learning to die. Although the artwork is only in its early stages, the composition is clear and distinctive. Jerome, as a penitent, is in the center of the artwork, situated on a slight diagonal and viewed from above. His kneeling posture resembles a trapezoid, with one arm extended to the painting's edge and his gaze turned in the opposite direction. J. Wasserman highlights the connection between this artwork and Leonardo's anatomical investigations. Across the foreground sprawls his symbol, a large lion whose body and tail form a double spiral across the bottom of the picture space. The other striking aspect is the rough backdrop of rocky rocks against which the man is silhouetted. The audacious exhibition of figure arrangement, landscape features, and personal drama are also present in the great unfinished work, Adoration of the Magi, commissioned by the monks of San Donato a Scopito. It is a complex composition measuring roughly 250 by 250 centimeters. Leonardo created multiple drawings and preliminary studies, including a realistic linear perspective of the damaged classical architecture that serves as the background. Leonardo traveled to Milan in 1482 at the request of Lorenzo de Medici to curry favor with Ludovico I. L. Moro, and the work was abandoned. The third significant work of this period is the Virgin of the Rocks, which was commissioned in Milan for the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception. The painting, to be completed with the assistance of the Depredis brothers, was intended to occupy a big intricate altarpiece. 
Leonardo opted to paint a legendary scene from Christ's childhood in which the infant John the Baptist, protected by an angel, met the Holy Family on the trip to Egypt. The artwork has an unsettling beauty, with beautiful individuals kneeling in adoration around the infant Christ in a wild environment of tumbling rock and spinning water. While the painting is rather large, around 200 by 120 centimeters, it is not quite as complicated as the painting ordered by the monks of San Donato, with only four figures instead of about 50 and a rocky terrain rather than architectural features. The painting was eventually finished, in fact, two versions were completed, one remained in the confraternity chapel, while Leonardo carried the other to France. The brothers did not receive their artwork, nor did the Depredis receive payment, until the following century. Leonardo's most noteworthy portrait of this period is the lady with an ermine, assumed to be Cecilia Gallerani, C.1483-1490, lover of Ludovico Sforza. The artwork is distinguished by the figure's position, with the head twisted at a sharp angle to the torso, which was rare at the time when most portraits were remained rigidly in profile. The ermine clearly has symbolic importance, referring to either the sitter or Ludovico, who belonged to the famous order of the ermine. Paintings from the 1490s The Last Supper, commissioned for the refectory of the convent of Santa Maria del Grazie in Milan, is Leonardo's most well-known painting from the 1490s. It depicts Jesus' last lunch with his disciples before his imprisonment and death, as well as the moment when Jesus says, One of you will betray me, and the worry that this remark causes. Matteo Bondello, a writer, witnessed Leonardo at work and wrote that on some days, he would paint from dawn to sunset without eating, and then not paint for three or four days. The convent's prior was perplexed by this and pursued him until Leonardo requested Ludovico's intervention. Vasari recalls how Leonardo, concerned about his ability to accurately paint the faces of Christ and the traitor Judas, told the Duke that he could have to use the prior as his model. The picture was praised as a masterpiece of design and characterization, but it deteriorated quickly, and within a century, one visitor described it as, completely ruined. Instead of utilizing the dependable technique of fresco, Leonardo utilized tempera over a mostly gesso basis, resulting in a surface prone to mold and flaking. Despite this, the picture is still one of the most widely duplicated pieces of art, with numerous replicas created in a variety of media. In 1498, Leonardo painted a trompelloi decoration of the Sala del Assi for the Duke of Milan at the Castello Sforzesco. Paintings from the 1500s Leonardo was commissioned to paint the Battle of Anghiari in the Salone dei Cinquecento, Hall of the 500, in Florence's Palazzo Vecchio in 1505. Leonardo created a dramatic composition representing four warriors riding wild war horses fighting for possession of a standard at the Battle of Anghiari in 1440. Michelangelo was given the other wall to depict the Battle of Cassina. Leonardo's picture deteriorated quickly, and we now only know it from a Rubens copy. Leonardo's 16th century paintings include the miniature portrait known as the Mona Lisa or La Gioconda, the Laughing One. It is often regarded as the world's most renowned painting today. Its reputation stems, in particular, from the enigmatic smile on the woman's face, which may be attributed to the subtly shaded corners of the mouth and eyes, making the exact nature of the smile impossible to detect. Leonardo's smoke, or the murky quality for which the piece is famous, became known as Sfumato. The smile, according to Vasari, was so pleasing that it seems more divine than human, and it was considered a wondrous thing that it was as lively as the smile of the living original. Other aspects of the artwork are the plain attire, in which the eyes and hands do not compete with other details, the dramatic landscape background, in which the universe appears to be in flux, the subdued coloring, and the extraordinarily smooth texture of the painterly approach, which uses oils poured on like tempera and mixed on the surface so that the brush strokes are undetectable. Vasari claimed that the painting's quality would cause even the most confident master, despair and lose heart. It is unusual for a panel painting of this age to be in such good condition and to show no signs of restoration or overpainting. In the picture Virgin and Child with Saint Anne, the composition picks up the theme of figures in a landscape, which Wasserman characterizes as breathtakingly beautiful. 
and pays homage to St. Jerome by placing the image at an oblique angle. This picture is notable for the superimposition of two obliquely positioned figures. Mary sits on her mother, St. Anne's, knee. She bends forward to stop the Christ child as he roughhouses with a lamb, foreshadowing his own impending sacrifice. This artwork, which was reproduced numerous times, impacted Michelangelo, Raphael, and Andrea del Sarto, and then Pontormo and Correggio. The Venetian artists Tintoretto and Veronese were particularly influenced by compositional developments. Drawings Leonardo was a prolific draftsman who kept journals filled with little sketches and elaborate drawings of everything that caught his eye. In addition to the journals, there are numerous painting studies, some of which can be traced back to specific works such as the Adoration of the Magi, the Virgin of the Rocks, and the Last Supper. His earliest stated work is a landscape of the Arno Valley from 1473, which depicts the river, mountains, Montalupo Castle, and farmlands beyond it in amazing detail. Among his most renowned drawings are the Vitruvian Man, a study of the proportions of the human body. The artist's works include the head of an angel for the Virgin of the Rocks at the Louvre, a botanical study of Star of Bethlehem, and a massive sketch, 160 by 100 centimeters, of the Virgin and Child with Saint Anne and Saint John the Baptist in the National Gallery in London. This drawing uses the delicate sfumato shading technique, similar to the one used by the Mona Lisa. It is believed that Leonardo never painted it, the closest similarity is to the Virgin and Child with Saint Anne in the Louvre. Other interesting drawings include various studies known as caricatures, because, while exaggerated, they appear to be based on observations of living models. According to Vasari, Leonardo looked for unusual faces in public to use as models for some of his work. There are numerous studies of handsome young men, frequently linked with Salai, with the unique and greatly loved facial trait, the Grecian profile. These faces are frequently contrasted with that of a warrior. Salai is often portrayed in fancy dress costumes. Leonardo is known to have designed sets for pageants, which may be related. Other, more detailed sketches depict drapery studies. Leonardo's ability to draw drapery improved significantly during his early work. Another frequently copied image is a gruesome sketch by Leonardo in Florence in 1479 of Bernardo Baroncelli's body, which was hanged in connection with the murder of Giuliano, brother of Lorenzo de Medici, as part of the Puzzi conspiracy. Leonardo noted the colors of Baroncelli's robes as he died. Leonardo, like the two contemporary architects Donato Bramanti, who constructed the Belvedere Courtyard, and Antonio de Sangallo the Elder, experimented with concepts for centrally organized churches, and a number of them appear in his diaries as drawings and perspectives, though none were ever built. Journals and Notes Renaissance humanism recognized no mutually incompatible polarity between science and art, and Leonardo's scientific and technical pursuits are sometimes regarded as equally outstanding and inventive as his artistic output. These studies were documented in 13,000 pages of notes and drawings that combined art and natural philosophy, a predecessor to contemporary science. They were created and maintained on a daily basis throughout Leonardo's life and travels, as he constantly observed his surroundings. Leonardo's notes and sketches show a wide range of interests and preoccupations, from lists of groceries and persons who owed him money to interesting designs for wings and water shoes. There are compositions for paintings, studies of details and drapery, studies of faces and emotions, animal and baby dissections, plant studies, rock formations, whirlpools, war machines, flying devices, and architecture. Following Leonardo's death, his disciple and heir Francesco Melzi was entrusted with the majority of these notebooks, which were initially loose papers of various types and sizes. These were to be published, a daunting effort given the vastness and Leonardo's unique writing style. An unknown Milanese artist replicated some of Leonardo's designs for a proposed dissertation on art around 1570. After Melzi's death in 1570, the collection was passed down to his son, the lawyer Orazio, who first showed little interest in the diaries. In 1587, a Melzi household tutor called Lelio Gavardi carried 13 of the manuscripts to Pisa, 
where the architect Giovanni Magenta chastised Gavardi for taking the manuscripts illegally and returning them to Orazio. Orazio, who owned a large number of similar works, gave the volumes to Magenta. As word spread about Leonardo's missing writings, Orazio rescued seven of the thirteen manuscripts, which he subsequently donated to Pompeo Leone for publishing in two volumes, one of which being the Codex Atlanticus. The remaining six works were allocated to a few others. Following Orazio's death, his heirs sold the remainder of Leonardo's goods, causing their dispersal. Major collections include the Royal Library at Windsor Castle, the Louvre, the Biblioteca Nacional de España, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Biblioteca Ambrosiana in Milan, which holds the 12-volume Codex Atlanticus, and the British Library in London, which has online a selection from the Codex Arundel, BL Arundel MS 263. Works have also been housed at Holcomb Hall, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and in the private collections of John Nicholas Brown I and Robert Lehman. Bill Gates owns the Codex Lester, Leonardo's sole privately held major scientific work, which is shown once a year in various places around the world. The majority of Leonardo's writings were in mirror image cursive. Leonardo wrote with his left hand, therefore writing from right to left was probably easier for him. Leonardo utilized a variety of shorthand and symbols, and his notes indicate that he intended to publish them. In many situations, a single topic is treated in depth using both words and pictures on a single sheet, delivering information that would not be lost if the pages were published out of sequence. The reason they were not published during Leonardo's lifetime is unknown. Science and Inventions Leonardo's approach to science was observational. He attempted to comprehend a phenomenon by describing and painting it in great detail, with no emphasis on experiments or theoretical explanations. Contemporary researchers mostly dismissed Leonardo the scientist due to his lack of formal education in Latin and mathematics, despite the fact that he taught himself Latin. His excellent insights in numerous fields were highlighted, such as when he wrote I.L. Sol non as I move. The sun does not move. In the 1490s, he studied mathematics under Luca Pasilli and created a sequence of drawings of regular solids in skeletal form to be engraved as plates for Pasilli's book Divina Proportion, published in 1509. While residing in Milan, he investigated light from the summit of Monte Rosa. Scientific essays in his notebook on fossils have been regarded as influential in early paleontology. The contents of his journals indicate that he was preparing a series of treatises on various topics. Cardinal Louis d'Aragon's secretary is believed to have witnessed a coherent anatomy treatise during a visit in 1517. Melzi compiled aspects of his work on anatomy, light, and landscape studies for publication, which was finally published as a treatise on painting in France and Italy in 1651 and Germany in 1724, including engravings based on paintings by classical painter Nicolas Poussin. According to Arras, Leonardo's book, which was published in 62 editions in France over a 50-year period, established him as the precursor of French academic thought on art. While Leonardo's experimentation used scientific methods, Fritjof Capra's recent and exhaustive analysis of Leonardo as a scientist argues that Leonardo was fundamentally different from Galileo, Newton, and other scientists who followed him in that, as a Renaissance man, his theorizing and hypothesizing integrated the arts, particularly painting. Anatomy and Physiology Leonardo began his studies in anatomy of the human body under the tutelage of Verrocchio, who insisted that his students gain a thorough understanding of the topic. As an artist, he quickly mastered topographic anatomy, creating several studies of muscles, tendons, and other visible anatomical characteristics. Leonardo, a successful artist, was granted permission to dissect human bodies at the Hospital of Santa Maria Nuova in Florence, followed by hospitals in Milan and Rome. From 1510 to 1511, he worked on his studies with Dr. Marcantonio della Torre, a professor of anatomy at the University of Pavia. Leonardo created more than 240 precise illustrations and penned over 13,000 words for an anatomical treatise. Only a minor portion of Leonardo's treatise on painting contained information about anatomy. 
While Melzi was dividing the material into chapters for publishing, a number of anatomists and artists, including Vasari, Cellini, and Albrecht Dürer, viewed it and drew drawings from it. Many of Leonardo's anatomical drawings focus on the human skeleton and its components, as well as muscles and sinews. He investigated the mechanical functions of the skeleton and the muscle forces that act on it in a way that anticipated the contemporary study of biomechanics. He created one of the earliest scientific sketches of a fetus in gestation, depicting the heart and vascular system, as well as the sex organs and other internal organs. The drawings and notation were much ahead of their time, and if published, would definitely have made a significant contribution to medical knowledge. Leonardo also closely examined and recorded the effects of aging and human emotion on physiology, focusing on the impacts of wrath. He sketched numerous people with severe facial abnormalities or evidence of disease. Leonardo also examined and depicted the anatomy of various animals, dissecting cows, birds, primates, bears, and frogs and compared their physical structures to those of humans. He also conducted numerous experiments on horses. Leonardo's dissections and documenting of muscles, nerves, and arteries contributed to understanding the physiology and mechanics of movement. He endeavored to determine the source of emotions and how they were expressed. He struggled to assimilate the current system and theories of bodily humors, but eventually abandoned these physiological explanations of physical processes. He observed that humors were not located in brain spaces or ventricles. He established that the humors were not confined in the heart or liver, and that the heart was responsible for the circulatory system. He was the first to identify atherosclerosis and liver cirrhosis. He made replicas of the cerebral ventricles out of melted wax and built a glass aorta to observe blood circulation through the aortic valve using water and grass seed to monitor flow patterns engineering and innovations. Throughout his life, Leonardo was also respected as an engineer. Leonardo studied and designed several tools and devices using the same rational and analytical approach that inspired him to portray the human body and investigate anatomy. He depicted their anatomy with exceptional competence, creating the first modern technical drawing, complete with a perfected, exploded view technique for representing internal components. The research and initiatives collected in his codices total more than 5,000 pages. In a 1482 letter to Milan's Lord Ludovico I. L. Moro, he stated that he could build a variety of machines for both city defense and siege. When he fled from Milan to Venice in 1499, he sought work as an engineer and created a system of mobile barricades to keep the city safe from invasion. In 1502, he devised a plan to alter the flow of the Arno River, on which Niccolò Machiavelli collaborated. He continued to consider the canalization of Lombardy's plains while in the company of Louis XII, as well as the lawyer and its tributaries in the company of Francis I. Leonardo's journals contain an enormous number of inventions, both practical and impractical. They consist of musical instruments, a mechanical knight, hydraulic pumps, reversible crank mechanisms, finned mortar rounds, and a steam cannon. Leonardo was obsessed by flight for much of his life, producing many studies, notably Codex on the Flight of Birds, circa 1505 and blueprints for several flying machines, including as a flapping ornithopter and a helical rotor. Channel 4's 2003 program Leonardo's Dream Machines translated and created several Leonardo concepts, such as a parachute and a big crossbow. Some of the concepts were successful, while others performed poorly when tested. Similarly, a team of engineers created 11 devices designed by Leonardo for the 2009 American television series Doing Da Vinci, which included a battle vehicle and a self-propelled cart. Mark Van Den Broek's research found older prototypes for over 100 Leonardo innovations. Similarities between Leonardo's images and drawings from the Middle Ages, Ancient Greece and Rome, the Chinese and Persian empires, and Egypt indicate that many of Leonardo's ideas were developed prior to his death. Leonardo's innovation was to mix several functions from previous drafts and arrange them in situations that demonstrated their utility. He invented something fresh by combining technical inventions. 
Leonardo originally wrote down the rules of sliding friction in his notebooks in 1493. His interest in friction sprang partly from his research into perpetual motion, which he correctly determined was impossible. His findings were never published, and the friction laws were not found until 1699 by Guillaume Montans, with whom they are now most commonly identified. Duncan Dowson designated Leonardo the first of 23 men of tribology for his contributions. Legacy Although he received no formal academic instruction, many historians and researchers see Leonardo as the epitome of the universal genius or renaissance man, as someone with unquenchable curiosity and a feverishly inventive imagination. He is widely regarded as one of the most talented individuals of all time. According to art historian Helen Gardner, the width and depth of his interests were unparalleled in recorded history. And, his mind and personality seem to us superhuman, while the man himself mysterious and remote. Scholars understand his worldview as logical, despite the fact that his empirical methods were unconventional at the time. Leonardo's fame during his existence was such that the King of France hauled him away as a prize and was said to have supported him in his old age, holding him in his arms as he died. Interest in Leonardo and his work has never waned. Crowds still line up to see his most renowned works, t-shirts still feature his most famous drawing, and writers continue to acclaim him as a genius while speculating on his private life and what one so bright actually believed in. Many additional literary tributes to Leonardo illustrate his enduring admiration among painters, critics, and historians. Baldassare Castiglione, creator of Il Cortigiano, the courtier, claimed in 1528 that, Another of the greatest painters in this world looks down on this art in which he is unequaled. In 1540, the biographer Anonimo Gadiano stated, His genius was so rare and universal that it can be said that nature worked a miracle on his behalf. Vasari, in his Lives of the Artists, 1568, opens his chapter on Leonardo. In the normal course of events, many men and women are born with extraordinary talents. However, in a way that transcends nature, a single person is marvelously endowed by heaven with beauty, grace, and talent in such abundance that he leaves other men far behind, all of his actions appear inspired, and everything he does clearly comes from God rather than human skill. Everyone agreed that this was true of Leonardo da Vinci, an artist of exceptional physical beauty who demonstrated infinite grace in all he did and honed his genius so brilliantly that he solved any issues he studied easily. The 19th century saw a surge in enthusiasm for Leonardo's genius, prompting Henry Fuseli to remark in 1801. Such was the start of modern art, when Leonardo da Vinci came forth with a brightness that distanced prior excellence, composed of all the parts that comprise the essence of genius. A. E. Rio repeated this in 1861, writing, He towered above all other artists through the strength and nobility of his talents. By the 19th century, the scope of Leonardo's writings and paintings had become well known. In the year 1866, Hippolyte Taine remarked, There may not be in the world an example of another genius so universal, so incapable of fulfillment, so full of yearning for the infinite, so naturally refined, so far ahead of his own century and the following centuries. Leonardo is the only artist about whom it is possible to say with absolute certainty that nothing he touched was not transformed into something of timeless beauty. Whether it was a skull cross-section, a wheat structure, or a muscle research, he used his sense of line, light, and shade to transform it into life-communicating values. The fascination in Leonardo's creativity has never waned. Specialists study and translate his writings, use scientific procedures to analyze his paintings, debate attributions, and look for works that have been documented but never discovered. Liana Bordelin wrote in 1967. Because of the variety of interests that drove him to investigate every branch of knowledge, Leonardo can be considered, quite appropriately, to have been the universal genius par excellence, with all the troubling connotations that come with that title. When confronted with a genius, man is just as uncomfortable now as he was in the 16th century. Even after five centuries, we continue to admire Leonardo. Walter Isaacson, a 21st century novelist, based most of his history on thousands of notebook entries, scrutinizing Leonardo's personal notes, sketches, 
budget notations, and speculations. Isaacson was surprised to discover a fun, joyous side to Leonardo, in addition to his boundless curiosity and creative genius. On the 500th anniversary of Leonardo's death, the Louvre in Paris organized the largest single exhibition of his art, Leonardo, from November 2019 to February 2020. The exhibition features over 100 paintings, drawings, and notebooks. Eleven of Leonardo's works from his lifetime were included. The Louvre has five of them, but the Mona Lisa was not included due to its high demand among public tourists. It is still on show in the Louvre's gallery. However, Vitruvian Man is now on exhibit following a court struggle with its owner, the Gallery dell'Accademia in Venice. Salvatore Mundi was also excluded because its Saudi owner declined to lease the piece. The Mona Lisa, considered Leonardo's masterpiece, is widely regarded as the most renowned portrait ever created. The Last Supper is the most popular religious artwork of all time, and Leonardo's Vitruvian Man drawing is likewise regarded as a cultural icon. Alessandro Vetsosi and Agnes Sabato's more than a decade-long examination of Leonardo's genetic lineage was completed in mid-2021. It was discovered that the artist has 14 living male relations. The work could also help determine the legitimacy of Leonardo's remains. Location of Remnants While Leonardo was undoubtedly buried at the College Church of St. Florentine at the Chateau d'Amboise on August 12, 1519, the current location of his remains is unknown. Much of Chateau d'Amboise was devastated during the French Revolution, resulting in the church's demolition in 1802. Them of the graves were demolished in the process, scattering the bones laid there and making the location of Leonardo's remains uncertain. A gardener may even have buried them in the courtyard's corner. In 1863, Fine Arts Inspector General Arsène Husse received an imperial commission to excavate the site, where he discovered a partially complete skeleton with a bronze ring on one finger, white hair, and stone fragments bearing the inscriptions E-O-A-R, D-U-S, and Vince, interpreted as forming Leonardus Vinci. The skull's eight teeth belong to someone of the same age, and a silver shield discovered among the bones depicts a beardless Francis I, which matches the king's appearance during Leonardo's stay in France. Jose proposed that Leonardo's abnormally large skull was a sign of his brilliance. Author Charles Nichol described this as a dubious phrenological deduction. At the same time, Jose observed various difficulties with his observations, such that the feet were oriented toward the high altar, a technique normally reserved for laymen, and that the skeleton of 1.73 meters, 5.7 feet, appeared to be too short. Failed verification. See discussion. In 1874, art historian Mary Margaret Heaton noted that the height was appropriate for Leonardo. The skull was purportedly given to Napoleon III before being returned to the Chateau d'Amboise, where it was reburied in the Chapel of St. Hubert in 1874. A marker above the tomb notes that the contents are only thought to be Leonardo's. It has been proposed that the folding of the skeleton's right arm over the head corresponds to the paralysis of Leonardo's right hand. In 2016, it was reported that DNA tests would be performed to ascertain whether the attribution is correct. The remains DNA will be compared to samples acquired from Leonardo's work and his half-brother Domenico's descendants, and it may also be sequenced. In 2019, records were released confirming that Jose preserved the ring and a lock of hair. In 1925, his great-grandson sold the items to an American collector. Sixty years later, another American purchased them, and they will be on exhibit at the Leonardo Museum in Vinci beginning May 2, 2019, the 500th anniversary of the artist's death. I want you to express your personal thoughts and reactions to the documentary in the comments area. Use this chance to express your respect for Kuroda's unrelenting tenacity and resilience, as well as your thanks for the sacrifices made by him and his friends. Encourage viewers to subscribe to your YouTube channel in order to join our ever-growing community, and ask them to help spread the word by sharing the video with their friends and family. By raising awareness about this important piece of history, we can ensure that Sergeant Robert Kurodas and his fellow veterans' legacy lives on and inspires future generations. Through the creation and distribution of this documentary, 
You have the ability to honor Sergeant Robert Kuroda's legacy in a profound and enduring way, ensuring that his narrative resonates with audiences for years to come.